Okay, well, I am so excited to, to be here with all of you. Um, different people have promised different uh, things that I'm supposed to be doing today, Frank and Ben, and I guess we have that kind of relationship that they're like, Brenda will do it, she'll talk to you about it. But what I wanna talk to you about is actually you and Colorado. And what I see as that has you know, been your journey, um, some reflections I have and some thoughts I have about your tasks moving forward, just from my perspective um, in my neck of the woods in, in Tennessee. And I definitely would like to open up toward the end. If you have any specific questions or anything about our shop, I am happy to answer questions in, in that way. I very much think that we're like a family. Um, I know Frank and Ben for many, many years. They are like my extended family. So um, I feel like this is a safe place, a comfortable place. And so we should just, you know, chat. Wait, so my first. Working through that. They are working through the technical issues here. So um, one of the things I will do is I will start by talking with you about um, my perspective in, in Cherokee. And, and Ben gave a little bit of an overview of Cherokee Health Systems. But we are a large federally qualified health center and community mental health center in Tennessee. And uh, we have been blending behavioral health and primary care services, hi me, <laughs> for uh, 40 years. We started out as a community mental health center and then began um, really absorbing primary care about 25 years ago, primarily because nobody would see our patients for care. We have a saying, um, and I, I think this is one of the reasons that Frank first started liking me very early on, is when I said, this is our saying, Cherokee goes where the grass is browner. That, that's, our, that's our motto, is that's where we go. For me, um, watching this process for you has been really lovely, because as our organization has uh, built on integrated care, I have come into contact quite a bit with many people in Colorado who've been involved in integration and, and building integration. In fact, I was there when Ben first got the news that you had been awarded the SIM grant. Do you, uh, he probably doesn't remember this, but you're in DC, we were at the NIAC, we were at AHRQ, Frank was there, Steve Mellick, was there, and I remember that moment with Ben and his phone and laptop, which are connected to him, and he goes, we just got, we were awarded the SIM grant. And I, I don't know if you know Steve, Steve Mellick, he's an actuary. Um, you know, most numbers people have a limited affective range, but he showed more emotion than I've seen him like ever. He's like, yes, so that excitement um, was definitely felt in the room. And so what a treat for me. Uh, and I, end up getting to visit um, a number of uh, friends in Colorado and different sites. So what a treat for me to be here. So are we going to try this again? They're working on it. Should I? OK. While they're working on it, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what my thoughts were um, about today. In Tennessee, we have some beautiful mountains, just like you have here. One of the, my favorite things flying into Denver is to, to see the Rocky Mountains. And for me in Knoxville and in our sites, when I walk around, when I walk around our clinic and drive through our sites, I get to see the mountains. What I really like about that is the perspective that it gives because no matter how rough our day is, no matter how difficult um, anything is going on, you can look at the mountains and get some perspective. You can look at the majesty of that space and be reminded that there's a lot more going on. There is something bigger than ourselves. So when I come here to Colorado and I go around to Grand Junction, I've been to, Col I've been to Greeley, Colorado like four times, which is so interesting. Um, I am reminded of the same things, all of the work that, that you're doing here in terms of moving the needle in population health in Colorado. When, for many of you, how many of you are clinicians? 
it's, it's almost everyone a clinician. One of the neatest things that um, I have seen with this initiative is that we are all getting a much broader perspective in what our role and task is. So as clinicians, what we think about usually is the patient in front of us, the person, right? Who's on my schedule for today? And then when you're going through your clinic, you have your clinic panel, your group of patients who you see. And you worry about those them too. You think about them too. When you go to community meetings, you will go and you will start thinking about people who are in other people's clinics, people who are in um, being taken care of in the hospital or other entities. Do we have it now? Almost. Almost have it. Here, with what you are doing with this project and this initiative since the last four years, you have been addressing health at every level. The patient in front of you, the number of patients in the clinic, the people in your region and community, as well as the entire state. And that is a real mind shift, isn't it? To be thinking about something well beyond what's right in front of you. So big things are happening in Colorado. I had to show the picture Smoky Mountains. We have smoke in our mountains, but that's different from your smoke, and I'll just, I'll leave it at that. No more jokes, no more marijuana jokes. Okay, beautiful, beautiful mountains. So many neat things going on um, here. And as I was saying, uh, when we think about our work now, it is not just about the person. That's the Colorado leaf. I was hoping to get to see fall here. I've seen little bits of the fall changing. Um, we think about this at the leaf level. You know how you'd see, um, look at, don't miss the forest for the trees. That's something I have to remind myself of. At the practice level, community level, when you think about our community, it's like a tree of leaves. We make changes and we implement programs. We think about it person by person, clinic by clinic, region by region, like you have in Colorado, and then the state. You really want to make a difference in terms of the overall health outcomes of an individual. One of the ways that I have started looking at integration is it has been defined by the World Health Organization. I find that it helps me to have a lens that looks beyond the clinic. Hyster historically, my job as chief clinical officer, I have to focus a lot on the clinical programming and how clinics teams are put together. But integration is bigger than that. So when I look at Colorado and what you all have done, a big part of what I do is I look through this lens and I see integration happening across all these domains. So as I go over the domains, please be thinking in your mind, what are you part of? What do you notice? This will help in your mind framework, ha have a framework for everything that's going on. Organizational integration, this is when different organizations come together. They don't have to merge, they can. They don't have to merge, but there is some coordinated network. There is a coordinated network. Functional integration, often this is called operational integration, but this is when a lot of the specific functions, you know, scheduling, electronic health records, paperwork, all of that is aligned. That's functional integration. Sometimes you have organizations that will work together, but they are not functionally integrated. Sometimes you have a clinic that is functionally integrated, but they're not integrated in terms of the service that they provide. So service integration is when you have different people from different disciplines working together on a multidisciplinary team. This often is like toddlers playing together. You know how watch how do toddlers play house together? They're each doing their thing side by side. So there are many, many clinics where they have multidisciplinary teams where people bring their expertise, but it really is like parallel play. Then we have clinical integration. At the clinical level, you really see one single coherent process. So part of what you have been talking about today has been how to implement those competencies from clinical integration. But just know that that's only one domain. That's one domain. And so as you're practicing 
day to day, seeing your patients, understand that there's a much broader context and community that you're in. So um, that's me looking at you from uh, Tennessee. What do I see when I spoke with Janet? She said, we should, you know, we want to know what's your view from a national perspective. What do people see when they think about Colorado and everything we're doing here? And like I said, for me, it's special because I have very dear colleagues. And I thought I would share some of my thoughts and perspectives um, as someone who lives in this space, sees a lot of uh, work done in states. And I wanted to highlight what I think are the triumphs for your project over the last four years. The battle scars, I think, are also really important to talk about. Here is my disclaimer. No one has told me anything about battle scars. No one has said anything about the challenges or difficulties. I'm going to go out on a limb and go through some battle scars that I bet each of you've all had. You know why? Because I've had them, we've had them, anyone going through this has had them. So please let me know if you figured out how to go through this without battle scars, but I think they're actually really important in this process, and they serve, a, they serve their own role. And then I wanted to share what I consider to be important in terms of your tasks ahead. So let's start with triumphs. Number one most amazing thing that you have done in Colorado is align pieces of integration in a way that nobody else has done. This is hard. There have been places that have integrated whole person orientation and access, integrated coordinated care and value-based payment. You have done all four. This is massive, massive. Just the fact that you have these incredible systems that are typically operating in silos and you're aligning all four, that is, a ma that is an amazing triumph. Yay for you all. Another triumph is expanding the reach of integration. There are some people in Colorado, I know, that 30 years ago in their own little neck of the woods have been practicing in an integrated fashion. However, it stayed very much in that little percent. This Everett Rogers curves that you see here, some of you may be familiar, this curve really talks about the diffusion of innovation. It has been used primarily in technology and now has been adopted across um, different markets and systems. I have seen an Everett Rogers curve um, about genes and what happens with certain fashions and genes. They plot this stuff. They plot this stuff. And what they find in terms of uptake is that in the beginning of anything new, you have a very, very small group of people, these innovators, who are willing to step out on a limb and try something new. That something new is clunky, it's messy, they're guinea pigs, they're working out all the kinks, they're willing to live in that really messy, yucky space because they just want to see if this would work. Then you have the early adopters, and those are people who start looking over, looking over at these you know, early, early, early folks, these innovators, and saying, maybe I'll try that. I won't be the first person, but I will expand on that. And I think probably about four or five years ago, you, were, have, you had a number of innovators and you had some early adopters, right? What you have done in the last four years is you're building an early majority. You are really broadening the scope of who gets integrated care, who understands integrated care. One day, one day, when someone gets care in Colorado, more often than not, they're going to get it in a fashion that is much more seamless and part of an integrated paradigm of care. That's just going to be the way that care is provided here. You're not there yet, but you are absolutely on the pathway. For genes, they actually identified, this is when Kim Kardashian wore the genes, this is when Beyonce wore it, and after that, then you got the late majority. Everybody started wearing it, it showed up at Target. So you are at this precipice. You are at this precipice where you want to move from the early majority into kind of building it into the norm. So actually, at some point, there'll be fewer people who don't know about it 
than who do know about it. This is, this is actually a really big deal, taking this to scale. Shared learning, days like today, days like today, where you're coming together and teaching each other, sharing experiences, learning how to do this. In a state like Colorado, like Tennessee, you have vast distances between you. Frontier land, rural land, your communities are different. But having a structure and an opportunity to talk with one another is absolutely essential. It's critical. I was at a year or two ago, maybe it was a year ago, I was fortunate to be part of an event put on by the Co-Earth um, Collaborative in Grand Junction. That was amazing. This is really tremendous um, from my perspective. Partnerships. You now have built bridges that have helped you achieve certain objectives that you normally could not have achieved. You have built partnerships that you did not know you could have even, even thought about 10 years ago. The partnerships that I just hear when I talk with people or I, I've read a lot about the work that you've done have been really terrific. Innovation, sometimes it takes someone writing a grant, putting that grant on paper and getting that grant funded for you to say, holy super fudge. They said that I ha we had to get this done. We said we have to do this. How are we supposed to do this? We have to find a way. How are we going to improve access? We'll have to do telehealth. How are we going to get from this place to that place? We're going to have to build a partnership. So think through the innovations that have been developed and are being developed now just to make sure that you are able to achieve the objectives of the original program. This is one of my favorite things that has happened, and that is you have made mayonnaise. How have you made mayonnaise? You have made mayonnaise not just a jumbo jet. This is probably one of the weirdest slides I show, because the people who get it are like, oh yeah, I know, I know how to make mayonnaise. I know where she's going. Mayonnaise is, homemade mayonnaise is really a product of what? How do you make mayonnaise, homemade mayonnaise? Egg, oil, salt, pepper, garlic, sometimes people put mustard, right? When you put the ingredients of mayonnaise together, you have transformed every ingredient. It's lost its original structure, flavor, texture, and you have created something different. That is a complex system. A jumbo jet is very complicated. Lots and lots of parts. Those parts may interact, but they do not change each other. You can take apart a jumbo jet and have those same pieces. You can't get an egg and oil and salt and pepper and garlic out of mayonnaise. You have now all changed each other. And you've changed your communities. You are now transformed. And your clinics and organizations have now been transformed into something that is completely different than you were before. And as Frank said before, Frank said, I would tell you this, you can't stop. You cannot go back. You can't go back. You are here. So you have developed a complex system, a complex organism, not a complicated one. And that is not easy to do. That is not easy to do. I like to include the key characteristics of integrated systems because I feel like when I go over the triumphs, everything that I see that you have all done well, that I've seen from afar, the next thing that goes into my mind is you have to build exemplars now. You have done some, very, some great work. Now is the time to say, how do we create some exemplars? And the way to create exemplars, the first place to start is say, what makes, an what makes a great integrated system? What makes a great integrated system? Like the World Health Organization definition, it's not just about having good clinicians. It's not. This is a systems issue. This is a cognitive issue. There's a mindset to this. So when, when you identify 
exemplar integrated systems, there's certain aspects that they all have in common. There's certain aspects they all have in common. And this was a study done by AHRQ. Um, Cherokee was part of that. I got to see all these observers going around. And here are some of the characteristics that were consistent across all systems. Mission and vision, sustainable staffing, structure of the organization, workspace, health information technology, individual and interpersonal practice, that's what you're working on today, and communication. I call this out because it's important to remember that you're, all, you're learning all these competencies and it is absolutely fantastic that you are building those skills. But that is not enough. That is not enough. My son, um, we're from Tennessee, so naturally, you know, he wanted to play football. Um, and when he, he was a quarterback in middle school and in high school, and he had a quarterback coach. And he would go work with that quarterback coach, but the quarterback coach was very clear that that did not substitute for the team practice. And he would say, learning how to be a good quarterback is not just about learning how to be a good quarterback. It's learning how to be the quarterback of a team. And that's different. That's different. You have to go back and interact with people and be in physical space and be a role model or deal with some issues. So these competencies are very good, but understand that what makes an exemplar is much more than individual competencies that you have control over directly. You need to understand that because you have to help build it. You have to help build it. Each and every one of these things is influenced by what we do. Implementation. Who thought this would be easy? It looks so, it really, I mean, when you look at, uh, when you look at uh, what integration is, it's really easy. On paper, you have, you know, you, you hear people talking about integration and they're like, yeah, you know, you work together as a team, you communicate, you, you have a cohesive care plan, everyone's on the same page. Does that really sound hard? It is in many ways a fake out like this fish looking into the other fish. You look so close, it's a fake out because it's really much harder than it seems. Much, much harder. You have your battle scars. These are battle scars. Remember I said, I'm not saying anyone told me that you've gone through this, but I have a hunch that some of these will resonate with you. First of all, your plan versus reality. It looks so pretty when you write out your plan on paper and you have this idea that you go from point A to point B and you're like, la, 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 we'll just get this done. And then in reality, when you're trying to get this done, you have potholes and ditches and bears and sharks, all kinds of challenges and really, really scary things that will distract you, they will challenge you, they will tax you, they will keep you up at night. They will push you in every way possible to turn around and go back to point A. This is a battle scar that's very important in terms of your mindset. When I first became director, of, I was director of integrated care, um, first at Cherokee, it was maybe 15 years ago or something, I'd been there a few years, and our chief operating officer um, very seasoned executive from you know, 20, 30 years. He had an open door policy, which is great. And the first thing I had to deal with, I don't even remember, maybe it was a scheduling issue and people were bickering, it was something like that. I would go into this office and I would be like, this is so simple, why are they not doing this? Why are they not doing this? And he got this little, I call it the Cherokee smirk because I swear like more than one person has it there but he got this half grin on his face. And I'm like, why are you smiling? This is horrible, da 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 da. And he said, you are earning battle scars. You need a lot of battle scars. And 
I was a little bit taken aback, and I said, well, that's a terrible thing to say. That doesn't help me at all. You are not helping me fix this problem. And he said, Corinda, you have to get used to it because nothing will go as planned. If you expect it to go as planned, you will be upset every single day. You will be in a lather every single day. So expect the bears, the sharks, the fires, the tornadoes, the tigers. If it doesn't happen, that's beautiful. That's your icing, gift for the day. Be grateful, but every day you come in, expect it. And don't expect it in a bad way, just accept it as something you have to embrace into your experience. We had um, one of our, in one of our clinics, one of our um, therapists um, very early on, her son was um, a Marine and he was in Iraq and we had just implemented a new upgrade of our electronic health record and he had called her from Iraq and he had, I was there with her and you know, when he calls, he calls, right? And he was wearing this like helmet thing. I mean, you know, it sounds like they're underwater. And he's like, mom, he, this guy is at war in Iraq, at war in Iraq. And he's like, mom, how are you? And she's like, this electronic health record is awful. This is terrible, blah, blah, blah. And patients aren't getting checked in and da, 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 da. And he said, mom, embrace the suck. <laughs> That's the way the Marines do it. So this is our thing, embrace the suck. Embrace it is part of the rich tapestry of what our lives are when we do meaningful work. Battle scar, plan versus reality. Conflicts. Does this look familiar to anyone? Sometimes people, you know, sometimes you really do feel like you are Godzilla, and I guess that's some sort of scorpion thing. Um, but conflicts are a natural part of life. Conflicts happen because people care. So when we say this is a smooth process, seamless process, again, it's a little bit of a fake out because you have very smart people who care a lot, who may have different ideas, and you welcome and want to have to work through this process of conflict to make those ideas a reality. I actually like when people disagree at Cherokee. It's how you do it that's important. Another important battle scar, learn how to deal with conflict. It's so easy to see a competency in terms of scheduling. Have you ever seen people get, it, get as upset as they talk about their schedules? That's like, man, people like you would think you're like taking their firstborn child, one 15 minute block, it's like DEF CON 5, you know, dealing with that. So look at conflict as a very important learning experience. So I would bet that for each and every one of you here virtually, Throughout this process, there have been conflicts. And I'm hoping they have been more good and helpful than not. But just like your plan, embrace this. This tension is what is needed for this evolution and transformation to occur. So don't get frustrated when someone disagrees with you. Don't. They may, think of, they may be making you think in a different way. The key is for you not to take it personally. I'm not naming names, but we all take things personally, but learning how to deal with it. Uncertainty. This is the one that's hardest for me. I was sharing this with um, Frank yesterday. There are many times in this process, I'm sure, that you felt like you did not know what was going on. Because whenever anything important is happening to a certain degree, it's not scripted. You don't know, what do I say now? What do I do? Do I call this person or not? Do we make this change or not? There is no script. We get like, you know, instruction manuals. We, I, we bought like a toaster. That instruction manual was so thick. All the different things, if this, then this, if this, then this, tab B. There is no instruction manual. There is no instruction manual that will take away some of the uncertainty and part of this process. 
because we have to create it ourselves. We have to create an understanding. Like Frank says, it's an iterative process. So one of the challenges for me in my own growth and development and at Cherokee has been sitting with that uncertainty. You don't need all the answers right now. You don't want to jump to a solution or an answer just because you want to know and not be confused or uncertain anymore. One of our, our director of psychiatric services will sometimes say to me, Perinda, don't just do something, stand there. You just sometimes have to let that space be there. Important, important lesson learned. How do you navigate all this? Frank talked about it. I'm sure this has been said multiple times. What is the secret sauce? Teamwork. Teamwork is one of those concepts that people use a lot. There are a lot of posters on it, a lot of quotes about it. But I don't think there's any real good definition of what makes good teamwork that can fully really describe the level of trust and safety and synergy that happens when you're on a good team. You all probably have an experience of what it was like to be on a high functioning team whether it was sports or in your family or with your friends, it could have just lasted six minutes. Sometimes um, all you need is like to see, oh, this person's, um, this person's car broke down, three different people stopped, and they're all working together as a team to fix this car. That is good teamwork. People may not even need to speak to each other. right? They have that mind meld, that cognitive, uh, what they call team cognition. This uh, work by Fiskella, Kevin Fiskella, I find fascinating because what, um, what he has done is taking, taken like what they know about teams, and this is teams in business, teams in the military, and then they look over and they say, what does this mean for primary care? Can this apply to primary care? And when they went into primary care practices and studied, they said, absolutely, it can apply to primary care. I just want to call out a few things. Um, abs the really important piece, the leadership and coaching. Here's, my, here's one thing I've learned about leaders. People choose their leaders. Title is just a title. People choose their leaders. Who is the person people go to? So whenever I go to a clinic or I'm thinking about restructuring, I look and see where people go to. And sometimes that change agent and person is not the designated leader. But everyone takes on that role in terms of coaching and leading. The cooperation piece is important. And I say this because, I mean, yes, you're all, a lot of behavioral folks in here. You should know this. But good teams create a safe place to provide feedback. I can't tell you how important that is. You have to be able to have a conversation with someone and say something they may not want to hear and feel safe that there's not going to be retribution. You're not always going to agree. In fact, you may not. But creating that safe space is absolutely critical for good teamwork to happen. Frank talked about this cockpit, co cockpit culture and if someone doesn't feel safe telling you know, the pilot, look, there's a mountain there, we're going to crash, it's not teamwork. It's not a safe place. You have to have that level of trust with each other. Now I'm going to go to the tasks ahead, because I think I've covered some of the key things I, th are, I think are important in terms of having um, these battle scars that you all have each battle scar teaches you a lesson. And you have some big tasks ahead. I don't want to stress you out. I promise I don't. But this is big. This is big. Colorado is leading the country. People are watching you. Because of that very first triumph, you are the one place that has aligned every critical domain in integration. They're watching you. You can't just stop here. You have a lot more work to do. And here's what I see. Number one, and again, uh, this is part of my soapbox. Keep your eyes on the target. Why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? 
integration is not the end game. It really ticks me off when you go to talks and all they do is talking about integration, like integration is the great thing. Integration is not the great thing. Integration is a vehicle. That is it. That is it. It has become this sexy, hot term. It's, yeah, like, right, anything that you, have you noticed anything that anyone wants to make look good, they throw integrated in there? Integrated systems, integrated car vehicle informatics, whatever. So, like, you know, it doesn't really mean anything if it's not connected to a goal. So if, if there is anything you leave here with, anything you leave here with, please, please, please do not lose sight of your goal. You want to make Colorado a healthier place to live, work, and play. That is it. If you find that dancing in the rain with some weird chakra does it, do that. I'll drop this like a hot potato. Do not get lost in this whole concept of integration so much that you lose your eyes on the prize. Guys, quality access, efficiency, equity, helping people lead healthy lives, thrive, be well. You live in this beautiful environment. We want everyone to enjoy it. I want you to think about this when you're sitting in a meeting and it has happened, it's happened to me. You're sitting in a meeting and you're talking about screening or care plans or you know, a, a certain kind of uh, patient issue and you find yourself getting so lost in the planning that the discussion is much more about integration than it is about why you're doing it. Don't lose sight, you have tremendous momentum now don't lose sight of the goal. Otherwise, don't make me come back here <laughs> and give you this other talk. OK. Oh, workforce. Oh, I know. I know. We don't have enough people to do this. Our pipelines are broken. We don't even have the right pipelines. There are kids who would be amazing in healthcare. Amazing, but they're not even considering it as a career. They don't understand what they can do. It's not in their mindset. They may be talking about computers or um, going into business or something like that. We have to do something drastically. I was very glad to know that you got a BWET grant, well, that you got a BWET grant in social work. You have to invest in the workforce. I say start early, start in middle school, high school. If you have a HOSA program or a high school program or middle schooler who's saying, can I shadow you? You say yes. You say yes. We need to make healthcare this sex, you know, make it Grey's Anatomy. Make it something that people <laughs> want to do. We have a serious workforce problem. We could triple, we could triple the workforce in Colorado and anywhere in the country. It still will not be enough. It was still will not be enough to achieve the objectives of primary care, of access, continuity, comprehensiveness of care. Major task ahead. Oh, data, data, data. I know you don't want to hear this. You, you know, if we're clinicians, we're just like this, you know, la la, somebody does that in some cubicle somewhere, right? The data right now are absolutely critical. This will be a game changer for us. Do you think I want to talk about data? Really? I hated my stats class in graduate school. But we need data, and more importantly, we need good data. Right now, the data is not good. The data we have is crap. And I say this, I say this because I have seen it. We fought like anything to get claims data. We fought like anything to get a lot of the measures with all of our contracts. And then when we looked under the hood of that data, I could not believe how messy it was. We had payers showing us data where they thought people were alive, but they, had de they were dead. They had people diagnosed with diabetes and depression, but they didn't. We had someone diagnosed with schizophrenia. They had them diagnosed with panic. Like, what is happening? What alternate universe am I living in that we have 
spent billions of dollars on the electronic health record and do not get me started on the electronic health record. But we have not achieved its promise. We have to be vigilant now to get good data, use it, and every single one of you, even if your job, you know, if your job is purely clinical, if your job is purely clerical, data has to be top of your mind too. We need good data. We do not have enough resources. We will not have enough resources. The numbers and the data are critical for us to be efficient and to know how to deploy those resources. Clinical informatics is something we all have to be aware of. How are we gonna identify what people's needs are? We are talking about population health, not just individual person health. There is no way that if you've got 20,000 people in your community without data, you can strategically target, ah, we need to deploy kind of case management here, I need to do more in terms of outreach here. You can't do that, and right now it's not good. It's not good. Some may be better than others, but I'm not convinced that we are anywhere near where we need to be in terms of data. It has to come to you. Please, Colorado, do this for the rest of the country. Clean up the data. Show us a better way. Show us a better way. Financial sustainability. So again, I don't wanna be up here talking to you about money and financial sustainability, but this is important and I think very connected to the data piece. You did get a bolus of money from the federal government. You do have funding right now. But there is a part of this that is going to involve investing in infrastructure and processes to make it sustainable. This is why sometimes I um, am really happy that we didn't get certain grants early on. We never got grants to do integration and we had to, from the beginning, be thinking about how do we make it work. Sometimes grants can hurt you that way. In many ways, they're good. Nobody, if there's a project officer here, don't take away any of the money. It's good. But be thinking about how do we make this our natural operation so we can make it work financially. We have to be thinking about it now. There is that section every time you write a grant, you know, how are you gonna sustain this? And that's, that's probably the shortest section of every grant because you're like, let's just see what we can put in there, right? But I do think it's really important because they want you to plan the project thinking about sustainability. So again, as you think, think about sustainability in everything you do. I'm going to um, wrap up with just a few words of wisdom. This is my favorite quote that I say at least once a month. The perfect is the enemy of the good. Should we start this program? We're not quite ready with our hospital discharge clinic. The perfect is the enemy of the good. It's okay to fail. It's okay to try something. Don't wait for something to be perfect. This is messy. Life is messy. It is uncertain. There will be conflict. Embrace all of it. Just do some good. If you can do some good, no one's gonna worry about whether or not it's perfect. If you are concerned about that, call me anytime and I will say, you can just tell me whatever the situation is and I will say, the perfect is the enemy of the good. It was, it's a tremendous release and freedom. You're like, oh, thank God, okay. It doesn't have to be perfect. Um, I, I know this can be very chaotic. Frank talked about chaos. Um, I love this quote, all great changes are preceded by chaos. Deepak Chopra, wellness guru. I had to share what our CEO of 41 years, Dennis Freeman, said when uh, we shared that quote with him. He said, all great chaos is preceded by chaos. <laughs> this is gonna bring me actually to my closing, which is the real, real secret sauce, and that is culture and that is culture. Who are you, your character, as a state, as a community? That really is going to drive how you change the health of your population. That's really what's gonna drive it. Because I cannot predict what kind of trouble is gonna show up, what kind of challenges, what kind of issues are gonna come up. I can't predict it for you. You can't predict it for you.
But what you can do is believe that whatever is thrown at you, you can handle. And we're going to build a culture that keeps your eyes on the target, that helps prepare you to work together to make Colorado healthy. And I know you can do that because this is your culture. I mean, who laughs when you're about to drown? <laughs> Only people in Colorado, right? This is your culture. You love this thrill. It is adventure. I hope you've enjoyed the ride. Please continue to enjoy the journey. It has been just a gift for me to be able to uh, just watch and observe all the wonderful things you're doing. And keep doing it. Keep doing it. Thank you.